from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Cleaning up after the storm. You know, this stuff not picked up in the next three to four weeks, it's going to disappear in the vegetation. The race is on to rebuild following those December tornadoes. Technology of the future. By enabling them to apply the non-residual herbicide only where it's needed. John Deere rolls out new innovations. While commodities surge to their biggest weekly gains since the mid-1970s. And drought nips at production. By far, the wheat belt is the biggest concern. Concern for the spring forecast today on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Drought now consumes nearly 60% of the lower 48, the most since 2012. And concerns are growing that a short winter wheat crop will only add to the scarcity of wheat on a global scale. As we've reported, the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada is disappearing following the driest January to February on record. Now with a third year of drought looking likely, the wheat belt is worried they too will see little to no moisture yet this year. Take a look at the latest U.S. drought monitor released Thursday morning. It shows 59% of the continental U.S. now covered in moderate drought or more. That's two points higher than last week. And if you go back a decade ago, the summer of 2012, nearly 64% of the country was in drought, a record high. Tyne Morgan joins us now from our Kansas City studios. And Tyne, even Kansas City is showing up on the latest drought monitor. Yeah, that's right, Clinton. I mean, as you can see today, the areas surrounding Kansas City are abnormally dry, but not D1 yet. But in talking with local farmers here, there are areas that typically hold water now standing dry. And I've talked to farmers really from Texas up to South Dakota that say drought is more of a concern this year than it was a year ago. Just weeks before spring planting, drought now covers nearly 60% of the continental U.S. That's the highest we've seen since we were coming off the peak of the 2012 drought a decade ago. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says while he has growing concerns for the state of drought today, he says his biggest trepidation sets with one major crop. By far, the wheat belt is the biggest concern. If you look at crop conditions in areas where the crop's starting to actively grow, it's absolutely terrible. Weak conditions all across the plains showing the scars from little to no moisture. And some farmers say wheat on dry land acres have yet to even sprout. You're into Texas, you've got three quarters of the winter wheat crop rated in very poor to poor condition. Almost that much of the rangeland and pasture land, 69% currently rated very poor to poor. And soil moisture in Kansas, Oklahoma and Texas at least 75% very short to short at the end of February. And so we are into showtime in the south and Texas wheat is already heading out in the, in the far south statewide. I think about an eighth of the crop is reporting heading. And so it is time for growth. Plants are demanding moisture there. And despite a couple of winter storms recently, a little bit of ice and snow in Texas, it is still critically dry. And without any big change in the pattern, that will quickly spread northward into Kansas, Nebraska, and eventually the western Dakotas and Montana here over the next few weeks, unless something changes dramatically. Well, Clinton, this is the latest spring drought outlook. And as you can see, it really doesn't paint much hope for those areas that Rippy just referenced either. It shows drought persisting or even intensifying through the end of May. As Rippy says, La Nina is lending no favors to areas seeing the stubbornness of drought. All right, thanks, Tyne. Now let's bring in meteorologist Matt Urasavik. Matt, a lot of questions about where precipitation may fall yet this spring. Yeah, Clinton, that's right. And uh, what we wanted to do is take a look at that spring outlook with regards to precipitation across the country. And if you take a look at this, a lot of the Four Corners region up right through the middle of the country is dealing with below normal uh, outlook for precipitation uh, right along the Gulf Coast and up parts of the East Coast as well. That also includes all the way back to the Pacific, parts of California. Meanwhile, the Pacific Northwest looks to be above normal, and so does that center part of the country where we've seen a lot of moisture already. But the story over the next couple of days is going to be out there in the west. A lot of rain, a lot of mountain snow, and that should help with conditions out that way as we're heading through early next week. And it could still be more precipitation as we head through next week. We'll have to keep an eye on that. But there's a look at the precipitation estimates 
one to two inches of liquid with some of those snowier, higher peaks out there in the west. That will likely help some of those drought conditions that have been ongoing for so long. And drip irrigation is the solution here. Take a look at this video from Don Hartman of New Mexico. He's using a Norseman planter to direct seed chili peppers under a biodegradable film. He says the setup should let him gain 20 to 30 days on planting, which hopefully will push harvest into mid-July instead of mid-August. That's some cool stuff. Thanks for sharing, Don. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Commodities are now seeing their biggest weekly gain since the mid-1970s measured across a number of indexes. With basis, corn is now being reported sold for $8 in places. Soybeans topping $17 per bushel on the board for a time before dropping back. Meanwhile, Chicago wheat broke through $12 Thursday. The global wheat market, driven by shrinking shipments from the Black Sea region, drought in South America, and as we mentioned, drought concerns here at home. Leaders at the National Association of Wheat Growers following every update closely as the world looks to adjust global flows. But when you have those two countries in a conflict, you are talking about a third of the world's wheat production. And as the winter wheat, which is what Ukraine predominantly produces, is starting to come back to life and start to grow and head into that tillering stage, you know, here in the next six weeks, if your roads are bombed out, your bridges are bombed out, uh, you can't get into your field because maybe your field has had destruction. Now, this is the ample, the prompt time to be putting on your crop protection tools, your fertilizer, and all those other risk management tools you need to increase your yield production. And if that doesn't happen, not only with what Russia is doing, but the decreased production in Ukraine will be feel, felt globally as well as here in the United States, which we've already seen in the volatile prices in the last two weeks. Meanwhile, Pro Farmers reporting that top Chinese government officials are ordering state-owned buyers to find and secure a host of key commodities, including barley, corn, and iron. Officials are worried about the impact of higher commodity costs on the Chinese economy. As U.S. commodity markets surge, an economist at the University of Illinois is warning about a global grain supply shortage and its potential dire effects. He's urging the Biden administration to open up the Conservation Reserve Program and its 22 million acres this cropping season to help stem the crisis. Well, I think we need to be now, under these extraordinary wartime circumstances, be thinking outside the box. And uh, one outside of the box suggestion I made yesterday in, on Twitter was maybe consider opening up the Conservation Reserve Program acreage for one year cropping. Um, it may not be practical, may not be legal, uh, but my point was is to really try to get people thinking. And Other farmers with acreage and CRP say even if they'd like to plant a crop, it's been too dry. Meanwhile, wheat markets continue to turn heads. We'll look at the entire wheat complex and what it means for spring next. And later, the destruction of a Kentucky Research Center is now sprouting with hope, an update in the country. And this month, get off the bench and in the game. On March 13th, brackets will open in the 2022 Bracket Busters Challenge presented by Case IH. Farmers will be able to take on farmers for a chance at a $1,000 top prize. Make sure to check it out. Go to adweb.com forward slash bracket busters for details and terms and conditions. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator, it's not just any closing wheel. Reach your yield potential. Pre-order by March 31st with coupon code AGDAY for $2 shipping per wheel. Dwayne Bussey of Bolt Marketing, our guest today. Dwayne, as we look at the overall wheat market here, obviously, uh, a dynamic time that we're living in, seeing where the levels are, uh, things we haven't seen in 14 years or so. Uh, what does this tell us about the condition of the crop in the ground now and expectations for wheat in the coming months? Yeah, there, there's a lot of unknowns out there. And right now in a bullish market, uncertainty actually equals higher prices. You know, obviously the Russia-Ukraine situation is the lead factor, right? We just don't know 
when their crops or their, their old crop or their new crop are going to be available for importers to buy. And then, like you mentioned, we got our wheat in the Southern Plains. This week, we've gotten very warm, too warm, if you ask me. We really don't want that wheat to break dormancy this early on because, of course, there's still some winter out there. We could go back down and freeze again. So there's a new threat of maybe frost uh, on that uh, winter wheat in the Southern Plains, not to mention how dry it's been down there already. As we start to talk about spring wheat, those numbers uh, up at prices we haven't seen in a long time, do you think that's going to draw some of these spring wheat acres uh, into the ground? Right now, I think it's actually too cheap, believe it or not. I, I think, well, when you look in comparison to uh, corn or soybeans, right, uh, that's the acres or the, that's the crops that they're going to compete with. I think you need that September spring wheat, Minneapolis, I'm talking, to get up to that 1050 area to really buy the the acres that it needs. And also you got some weather concerns. Actually, there's a pretty good snowpack in Eastern North Dakota right now. You get to the West, there's not much, but uh, maybe in the long term they do get the wheat planted. But uh, I don't know, I think the price can, might need to go up a little bit more to guarantee those acres. Dwayne, put this in context for me with this wheat market is. It's been a while since we've been at levels like this. It, it is, and I think the summary to take away from it is that these are high prices and actually prices that do need to be sold to protect it. I know I'm talking fairly bullish wheat market here today, but the world situation is not as tight as it is in, say, corn or soybeans. So, you know, eventually the Russia-Ukraine tensions do go down and that wheat is available. And even though I'm talking 1050 new crop spring wheat, that needs to be sold because eventually that will buy the acres, we'll get it planted. So great prices. Also great profitability we haven't seen, and like you said, for about 14 years. All right, appreciate it, Dwayne. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back with more AgDate coming up in just a minute. For marketing advice, call Bolt Marketing, a futures and options brokerage firm. Ag Day Weather is brought to you by Zoetis. Even though calves don't wait for perfect weather to arrive, you can count on Zoetis to be there. Share a picture of your newest calf and you could win a calving season survival kit. Enter now at calvingseason.com. Meteorologist Matt Yurisavik joining us now. Matt, we started talking about the drought monitor at the top of the show, and it really just continues to be pervasive, especially across the West. Yeah, that's right, Clinton. We haven't seen much improvement, although the extreme and exceptional drought conditions have been improved upon out in the West. And again, we're expecting to see a lot of moisture over the next couple of days, especially out there in the West. So hopefully we'll start to see a lot of this again get a little bit better as we're heading towards planting season. Unfortunately, it does look like we're going to be looking at uh, some drier conditions across much of this area as we head through the spring and even into the summer months. An early look out ahead shows that it could be abnormally dry back there in uh, parts of the area. Area where we're, we're parts of the country where we're still looking at those uh, at least moderate to severe drought conditions. Meanwhile, in the east, still looking at more precipitation as we head through uh, late early next week and then through ne much of next week. But we're going to be watching for some of that as we get a little bit deeper into uh, this forecast. And right here, you can see a lot of that going on in the east. A couple of storm systems next week bringing tons of rainfall into places that have already seen a lot. Meanwhile, back here in the West still looking at a decent amount of moisture more than we've seen over the past few weeks due to that atmospheric river and that big dip in that jet stream coming on to the south and a lot of that's going to fall in the frozen form here as we're heading through the mountains of California up into the Rockies there a couple feet of snow possible in the higher elevations there especially in parts of Colorado and then snow breaks out in the upper Midwest as we head through early next week so here's a look at that service map Again, the one system that's going to bring a surge in warmth coming right through the middle of the country. Very quiet off to the east, but then dealing with these upper lows spinning out there, bringing that higher elevation snow and some lower rainfall as well. This storm system continues to move on out of here. Could be looking at some chances for severe weather by Saturday and Sunday right along that cold front as well. And temperatures out ahead of it going to soar very, very warm, but then a very deep uh, drop in temperatures with that cold front on the backside and even some snow to the north in parts of the upper Midwest. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live.
Salisbury, Maryland, lots of sunshine, a high of 44 degrees. Mostly cloudy in Fayetteville, Arkansas, staying warm, a high of 71. And Selma, California, mild with rain showers, a high of 60 degrees. Up next, John Deere announces a host of innovations, including a new sprayer that only sprays weeds. And later, from Destruction to Hope, our research center in Kentucky is rebuilding following those devastating tornadoes last December. The country's largest equipment maker, John Deere, rolling out a host of new products, including its sea and spray technology, which it says can reduce non-residual herbicide use by more than two thirds. The system ready for use in corn, soybeans, and cotton, the sprayer technology is smart enough to tell the difference between weeds and crops and then only spray the weeds. It also allows for two different products to be used at once helping in the battle against resistance. We're all fighting to control weed resistance and weed pressure, and this is, a gonna, is gonna be a powerful tool to enable growers to do that by enabling them to apply the non-residual herbicide only where it's needed, and also do that in combination with the residual herbicide application in just one single pass. We're starting with herbicides, and herbicides are a large expense for our growers, and how can we help farmers manage their cost, manage their productivity, and improve actually the sustainability of their operation with a technology like computer vision and machine learning. And Deere says the sprayer is capable of operating at up to 12 miles per hour. Limited quantities will be available for ordering later this year. Deere also announcing updates for its planners in model year 2023, adding new frame designs, hydraulic downforce, pneumatic closing wheels, among many other changes. And it also released news about a new electric variable transmission and a new engine for select Series 8 and Series 9 tractors. You can read more about all of the innovations over at agweb.com. An outbreak of tornadoes last December left miles of destruction behind. Today, hope as a community works to rebuild a Kentucky Research Center. Next. Closed captioning on Ag Day is brought to you by BASF, helping you do the biggest job on earth. On December 10th, an EF4 tornado struck the town of Princeton in western Kentucky, leaving behind piles of destruction. That includes the Research and Education Center for the University of Kentucky. And as Jeff Franklin reports, work is already underway to rebuild and reclaim the facility and the grounds around it so its outreach can continue. A call went out for extension agents, volunteers, and anyone involved in agriculture to lend a hand in cleanup efforts at UK's Research and Education Center. Debris scattered all over these fields where specialists conduct research on small grains and other crops could be compromised. That's why Davis County Extension Agent Clint Hardy other agents and volunteers fanned out over the fields. It's a lot of cleanup, a lot of large items, uh, but then there's also a lot of just small debris scattered throughout the entire property. So uh, knowing that the staff here, uh, the specialist and, and, and the staff was gonna be overwhelmed with just trying to get their own things back in order, uh, we quickly volunteered to be of service uh, to come out and help remove some of the debris from these fields. The Research and Education Center sits on more than 1,000 acres. It will take a while for buildings to be rebuilt, but the goal is to restore fields now before the arrival of spring. We're eight weeks away now from spring green up and everything beginning to come back and you know this stuff if it's not picked up in the next three to four weeks, it's going to disappear in the vegetation. Over nine miles of fencing on the research farm was lost in the tornado, and fortunately only 10 animals from the beef herd were destroyed as a result of injuries. Beef handling facilities on the farm sustained substantial damage, but plans are to rebuild and restore better than it was before. So while we're, we're still assessing uh, the, the full extent of the damages here and, and figuring out how exactly we're gonna rebuild, um, 
we're we're moving forward with optimism knowing that that we are going to rebuild and we will be back. The beef unit at Princeton is a 100% fall calving herd and ear tags on the cows will provide animal behavior data right up to the tornado's point of impact. From the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, I'm Jeff Franklin. All right, thanks Jeff. Great to see the work being done there. And that's gonna wrap us up this morning. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Hope you have a great day on Farm Country.